Putin backs his Patriots call for an orthodox Christmas ceasefire in Ukraine. France is set to become the first nation to send Western-designed armoured vehicles to Ukraine to help fight Russia's aggression. Thousands of mourners attend the funeral mass for former Pope Benedict XVI in St. Peter's Square, led by his successor, Pope Francis. Vladimir Putin has ordered his troops to hold a 36-hour ceasefire during Orthodox Christmas. This was requested by the Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, Kirill, to allow Orthodox people in both countries to attend religious services. There are those in Ukraine who recall that Kirill has been a staunch supporter of the war initiated by Putin and consider the request for a Christmas truce as pure propaganda or a cynical trap. The Russian Patriarch's calls echoed a request from Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who has asked Putin to call a unilateral ceasefire as a prelude to peace talks. Putin responded that first, Ukraine must accept new territorial realities. The 36-hour ceasefire ordered by Putin will begin on Friday at 12 o'clock Moscow time and will extend along the entire front line in Ukraine. Western allies have moved towards supplying armoured battle vehicles to Ukraine for the first time since Russia's war began. But they're not the heavier tanks it requested. France says it will deliver light tanks. President Macron told Ukraine's leader Paris can spare some of its AMX-10 RC combat vehicles. It's been gradually replacing them with new Jaguar battle tanks. In his nightly address, Vladimir Zelensky stressed troops needed even more military hardware. We must put an end to the Russian aggression this year, he says, and not postpone any of the defensive capabilities that can speed up the defeat of the terrorist state. Modern Western armored vehicles, Western-type tanks are just one of these key capabilities. Meanwhile, Russia claims a continued offensive in the direction of the Donetsk region, which it partially occupies. It says it has successfully repelled Ukrainian counterattacks in the south. Heads of state, royalty and clergy from around the world joined thousands of mourners at the funeral of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, which was presided over by Pope Francis. Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni and Queen Sofia of Spain were among those in attendance. In his homily, Francis chose not to dwell on Benedict's specific legacy and instead delivered a meditation on Jesus and Benedict's willingness to entrust himself to God's will. Benedetto. Benedict, faithful friend of the bridegroom, may your joy be complete as you hear his voice, now and forever. During the ceremony, Archbishop Georg Genzheim, who was the personal secretary of Pope Benedict XVI, laid an open gospel on his coffin. Benedict, who was the first pope in recent history to retire from office, died on New Year's Eve, aged 95. He'll be entombed in the crypt in the grottos underneath St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It's clear that this funeral was not on the same scale as the one of Pope John Paul II in 2005, which drew more than 3 million people to Rome. And that's because when Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI died, he was not a sitting pope. But still, the event is set to go down in history. In fact, it's unprecedented uh, in modern times for a living pope to bury his predecessor. The liturgy, uh, in fact, was based uh, on that for a pope who dies while reigning with a few uh, modifications. Speaking in front of a crowd of around 100,000 people, mourners, Catholics, Pope Francis said that crowds had come to entrust 
Benedict's life to God and show undying love. Uh, European royals attended the ceremony as well as official delegations both from Italy and Germany and thousands of clerics from around the world gathered here in St. Peter's Square. Now Benedict's coffin has been transported uh, through the Basilica to the Vatican crypt for the burial which has been a private uh, service in the same spot where Pope John Paul II was initially interred in 2005. Giorgio Orlandi, Euronews, Vatican City. In what's the latest bombshell to rock the UK's Buckingham Palace? Prince Harry alleges his brother Prince William physically attacked him. That's according to the British newspaper The Guardian, which says it has seen a copy of the Duke's upcoming memoir. It's no secret the two brothers have been feuding in what has long been described as a royal rift. The newspaper reports an argument between the pair over Prince Harry's wife Meghan at his London home in 2019. In the book, Harry says William called Meghan difficult, rude, abrasive and was critical of their marriage. In turn, he told William he was parroting the press narrative. Things escalated and Prince Harry claims William knocked him to the ground. Two years ago, Prince Harry and Meghan left the royal family. The pair was in London just last year for the funeral of the late Queen Elizabeth, where onlookers suggested rising tensions. The Guardian says this attack is one of many bombshell claims in the highly anticipated book Spare, which is released on Tuesday. So far, there has been no response from the palace. The UK government's main opposition leader, Labour's Keir Starmer, is promising to take some power away from central government if his party wins the next election. It's the whole Westminster system. No similar country puts so much decision-making in the powers of so few people. It's no wonder the problems of communities up and down the country don't get the attention they deserve. In his argument for a more decentralised approach, some analysts are saying it appears to be a partial embracement of the language of Brexit, taking back control, a slogan bandied about during the referendum. But Starmer was clear in his intent. We will modernise central government so that it becomes dynamic, agile, strong and above all focused, driven by clear measurable objectives, national missions, a new approach to the power of government, more strategic, more relaxed about bringing the expertise of public and private, business and union, town and city, and using that partnership to drive our country forward. The Labour leader said his party would also repeal the Conservative government's anti-strike legislation should it come into force. A wave of industrial action across the public sector has prompted the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak to consider such legislation. Tech giant Amazon is planning to slash 18,000 jobs in a bid to reduce costs amid the cost of living crisis. It's the largest set of layoffs in the Seattle-based company's history, although it's only a small part of its 1.5 million global workforce. The company's CEO confirmed the losses will mostly impact the company's brick-and-mortar stores, including Amazon Fresh and Amazon Go, and there will be cuts to the European workforce. The move comes as Amazon faces a return to in-person shopping, as well as a sharp drop in purchasing power. Proof of a Covid vaccination is becoming a problem once again for tennis star Novak Djokovic. He is set to miss two of the most prestigious events on the calendar outside the Grand Slams, the Indian Wells and the Miami Open. It's because the United States travel authorities have extended the requirement for non-US nationals to be vaccinated. Twelve months ago, Djokovic was detained in an immigration hotel on arrival in Australia due to refusing to be vaccinated. He was later deported. 
The members of British heavy metal band Iron Maiden are joining a select group of musicians whose faces have graced the surface of Royal Mail stamps. From the 12th of January, the Postal Service will sell a dozen new stamps featuring the band, following the footsteps of Pink Floyd, the Beatles, and the Rolling Stones. Iron Maiden released its first UK number one hit in 1988, and it is considered by many to be one of the most influential groups of all time. With more than 130 million albums sold, over 2,000 performances, and 17 studio albums. Eight of the stamps will show images of the band's performances. Another four will show its famous mascot, Eddie.